If your ADHD was missed during your childhood and you're coming to terms with a diagnosis later in life, then this episode is for you. Ellie Middleton is a tremendous autistic ADHD content creator, but more importantly than that, she's a huge advocate for all things neurodiversity. Ellie's normally sharing her wisdom with her army of online followers, so we're tremendously lucky to have her all to ourselves today in the studio where I can let her share her amazing powerful personal story and pick her brains on some of the hot topics around neurodiversity. I hope you enjoy the episode. Watching the numbers go up really helps me avoid burnout and enables me to keep producing amazing content for you all. So if you're on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, or if you're listening to it on a podcast app, please hit the follow button. Thank you so much. Ellie, thanks for joining us. No, thank you for having me. It's so nice to be here. I watched your TEDx talk and it was so powerful the bits where you were describing the various stages of your life where you felt different so I suppose my first question is what's your earliest memory of feeling different I think it's hard because I think I don't have many memories I think that is quite a blur a lot of my childhood um but I think I was always a massive tomboy growing up I think it was probably like double-edged as well because so Growing up, all of my cousins until I was 10 were always boys and all of my like family friends all just happened to be boys. So it was always like, I don't know, however many boys and me. So I guess mm. I was always the different one anyway, just from being the only little girl. Um, but I guess, I guess when it really became apparent was, so I went to two different primary schools and the first primary school, my cousin who was a boy was in the same year group as me. Mm. So I feel like I was just... Um, copy of Ben for most of primary school so it was like he used to play football with the boys so I used to play football with the boys um so it was more that I knew that I was different at that point but it was more I was a tomboy rather mm. than anything else um but then when I moved to we moved house so I moved to a different primary school in year five and because it was a new girl entering the school it was like oh we'll find you a, a buddy that's a girl and we'll right. introduce you to the girls in the year group and mm. we'll sit you on a table with the girls in the year group and I think that was when I first that was when I first definitely started to have social struggles of like, uh, she's my best friend, so she can't be your best friend. And we've been friends for years, so you can't come in and be our, and I think that was like, whoa, like that doesn't really happen as much, I don't think with boys, because it's an extra person to play football or it's mm. an extra person to do whatever game you're playing. So it was the first time that I think social rules were really like imposed on me. So it was like, hang on, what is what am I doing wrong here? What's going on? Why am I upsetting people um, so I think that was probably um the main time when I first realized it but then there is a really funny story from when I was um like I don't even know how old I was I think I was like a, a toddler um and my dad tells me this all the time it's like my catchphrase of like so I one day decided that I wanted to crack an egg onto the patio to see what would happen um and my parents were like no you you can't do mm. that like you don't need to do that and I think it was about two hours that all I said was but I want to crack an egg <laughs> but I want to crack an egg and they're like but Ellie you don't you can't do that it's going to make a mess it's going to mm. go everywhere like it's going to be on the patio but I want to crack an egg so that's kind of like my catchphrase now where if I'm being stubborn about something my dad <laughs> will just look at me and go do you want to crack an egg and um, so I guess that's like maybe the first story of like when everybody else kind of realized that I was different but I think for me the time when I felt yeah felt like I didn't understand social rules was probably that when I was so I was in year five so I was like I don't know maybe 10 years old um mm. of like being almost like forced to be friends with girls and being like I don't know how to do this <laughs> was there a particular point where you became aware of social rules and you started to mask I think probably maybe around that point because I feel like because I had been such a tomboy you almost obviously there's still like some social norms but I think boys are let off the hook a lot easier than mm. girls are like obviously this is quite like stereotypical but because it was yeah like just playing sports I don't know playing football having a kick around it's not as much uh, and I think it's just like boys will be boys as well so I obviously didn't have that full extent but it was quite I don't know like less I think that was the first time I noticed them when it was like girl friendship groups of like uh I don't know, this thing's okay to talk about, but this thing isn't. These people can't be friends with these people. Mm. I think I noticed that a lot when I went to up to secondary school as well. So I then went to an all-girls secondary school, which probably wasn't the wisest thing to do. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was very much like 
these people are friends with these people so you can't mix and all of it I think that was like yeah probably those years um it's something that I like talk about with my mum a bit as well because my mum's always said like I I get annoyed that um I didn't get diagnosed as a teenager because I was spending a lot of time like under NHS care. I was with CAMS from 15. So I get really frustrated that I didn't get picked up at that point. But my mum's like, but by that point, nobody could have noticed that you were different or that you were autistic or that you had ADHD because you weren't you weren't letting yourself be. You had the, by that point, you were literally doing anything and everything to stay under the radar, fit in, be popular. Mm. So by that point, yes, you were like, there were outward signs as in like having what I now know to be meltdowns but what I was told were panic attacks but that was all that they were seeing was the anxiety the tearfulness the upset they weren't seeing any social differences because I by that point I was so heavily masking so I think it was probably those couple of years with like between like yeah 10 and going up to secondary school which was I think yeah before that point probably I was more being myself but it mm. wasn't really noticed as being that different because of the way that I was socializing but then I think by by definitely by like my second year of high school I had learned the rules like I think I knew what to do and I was like desperate to be friends with the popular girls mm. and I basically it was like do or die and I did <laughs> like I masked hard and I when I do talks I have some of my pictures from like secondary school and there's one picture of me in I think it's the start of year eight and then there's a picture of me at the start of year 10 so they're literally two like two years apart and it's like two compl it could be two different people you wouldn't know it's like mm. one is just like quite I don't know natural like not, not fashionable by any sense of the word <laughs> like not cool at all and then it's two years later and it's like bleach blonde hair fully back combed full makeup um wearing like a strappy dress and it was like yeah I think I very well pattern recognition skills I think I very quickly learned what to do mm. and maybe I didn't get it right at all times but it was quite like heavy yeah mm. by the time I was like halfway through um uh, high school was there a particular catalyst that led you to seek assessment for autism yeah so i i'd always struggled with my mental health so yeah when i was 15 i got referred to cams which is a children and adolescents mental health service um, and then i was so i was diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder and anxiety related depression um, and then within the next couple of years agoraphobia and panic disorder as well so it was all like very much considered to be mental health issues mm. rather than anything else um so my lowest was when I was 17 I dropped out of sixth form I had to decline my uni offers I became like housebound didn't want to talk to anybody was just like crying all the time basically um that was like the worst that I got I guess when I was 17 and then picked myself up like got a job um but I don't know so basically it was like a six month cycle from that point of mm. like that was my lowest and then every i'd have like six months of like getting myself better and then i'd go back to being like energetic bubbly ambitious like this like who i am now basically and then every six months it would go back to like crash and burn tearful had to leave jobs had to come home from traveling like didn't want to talk to anybody very anxious having panic attacks and that was like a six month every six months happened um so i guess i could feel it happening again um it was like the the spring of 2021 it was when we'd gone back into lockdown again after christmas so i think everybody was having a lot more time to reflect because mm. we couldn't leave the house um but i was kind of like could feel that this cycle was happening again and was just like adamant i was like i'm not i, I am not going there again like i found it really frustrating because i'd always been told that it was anxiety and depression and i'd always taken the antidepressants that they told me to take and I'd always done all the therapies that they told me to do and I'd read every single self-help book that I could get my hand I was doing all the like air quotes right things mm. but I still would end up in this black hole every six months so I was basically like I don't know just like this isn't happening again I need to work out what's going on here because it can't be anxiety because this keeps happening over and over and over again um at one point I really thought that it was BPD. Like I, I guess that was the only explanation that I'd ever seen of like why a woman would go from being very high to very low. And a lot of the symptoms kind of seemed to explain my experiences. So I went through a very, very stubborn stage of like really trying to convince my doctors, I need to go for a BPD assessment. I know what's going on here. This is what it is. I found the answer. And they were just like, no, that that's not right. That's not you, it's just anxiety. And mm. I was like, it's not just anxiety, like something else is going on here. Um, so that was kind of like where I was, I don't know, knew something different was going on, but didn't know exactly what it was. 
Um, and then I've told this story so many times now, but it's quite a good one. Basically, um, it was when England had got to the Euros final of the football. Mm. Um, so it was on a Sunday night, the match and the Monday. Um, so me and my partner at the time were both big football fans. So the Monday, my partner had managed to get off work, um, but I couldn't get it off work because people had already booked it off. So I'd said... If England win, I'll stay out and I'll just deal with the inevitable hangover the next day. It's like a once in a lifetime thing, whatever. If we lose, I'm going to get the last train home because there's no point in me having a rubbish day tomorrow if there's no reason for it. Um, and my partner had said to me, okay, whatever you do, I'll do the same. So if you go home, I'll come with you. Mm -hmm. If you stay out, I'll stay out with you. Okay, cool. And then obviously we lost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> some things are inevitable. Um, and then I was like, right, okay let's let's go get the train and my partner was like i'm not going home i'm mm. staying out like if i go home now i'm just gonna be fed up like i need to drown my sorrows go out see my friends um and i was like but you said if i went home you'd come home and he was like okay yeah i know i said that but i'm not coming home um so off i went home and then i brought the conversation up in counseling the next day and the counselor was like, well, what is it that's bothered you? Like, is it the fact that it was supposed to be a good day and it ended like on a sour note? And I was like, not really. Was it the fact that you felt unsafe, that you had to like get the train home on your own and stuff? And I was like, no, it doesn't bother me. She was like, well, what is it about that that bothers you? And I was like, he said, if the, if we lost, if I went home, he would come home with me. And he's then he didn't do that. So why did he say it if he didn't mean it? I was like, it really, really bothers me. Like I take words as gospel. If someone says something, then why why say it if you don't mean it um and then she just asked me the question has it ever been looked into why you take things so literally and i was like no it hasn't but i think i know what you're hinting at here and then i kind of went away and just you know <laughs> as we do hyper focused just googled <laughs> everything that i could possibly find about autism and then that led me to adhd as well um and just yeah everything just was like whoa okay yeah this is this is what's going mm. on here um so yeah a lot of luck really it turned out that that counselor her son was both autistic and adhd mm, so i yeah. guess she was maybe able to pick up things in our previous conversations of mm. like hmm, but maybe it wasn't her place to like say anything um but then at that point yeah i don't know i feel very lucky that that was a counselor that i ended up with like if i hadn't have brought up that one specific that's not something i would normally talk about in counseling it was just like a, a one-off bicker um but yeah, if that if you hadn't have said that mm. thing, I don't know if I'd have ever kind of come to that realization. I think the the journey you, you described of being diagnosed with anxiety and getting misdiagnosed, you're echoing the story of so many other people, I think. So I think they'll listen to that and see themselves in it. And the story, the particular story to you about the the what your partner said at the time and then your your doctor picking up on that is is a really unique detail that i think a lot, a lot of people will find super interesting and then you got that diagnosis and in that moment when you heard those words in that exact moment how did you feel i think when i actually got my diagnosis it was like complete like celebration because i think it's obviously a quite a long process that you go through and you've had to do so much research yourself and mm. i think it's quite nerve-wracking especially as like a, a woman or someone marginalized for their gender of like almost knowing that like I knew going into birth assessments, like I knew or I really felt like I knew that I was autistic and that I did have ADHD. Um, but it was like, well, if the doctor that I end up with doesn't happen to be very clued up on, you know, autism in adults, they might be used to diagnosing children if they're not used to diagnosing women or people marginalized for their gender, if they're not used to people who are very high masking, then it, there's a good likelihood that I could come out of this assessment and, and it be a no, even though, it's a yes almost mm. and I think so I think there was a lot of nerves so I think when I actually got the diagnosis it was like relief and it was like celebration of like I finally got my answers like I finally know what's going on here because I think yeah it'd been I, I think like I think a lot of the time I underestimate how like rough of a t ride I've had like if I, I dropped out of school like I physically could not leave the house to go to school I had to decline my uni offers like that's that's a really like I was really unwell and I think mm. I kind of forget about that a lot of the time. Um, but I think in that moment it was like, it all like, it all makes sense now. It was like a way to like, I guess, dig myself out of it. I think since then there's obviously like the grief that comes up of like, well, what if I'd have been diagnosed earlier? Like mm. I wouldn't have had such a hard time socially. I wouldn't have maybe had to drop out of school. Like I would have 
had a degree by now I like who knows what I would have been doing like I think that's come since but I think at the very like at the first time it was just like you know thank god I finally got an answer mm. you hear so many stories similar to that where somebody gets a diagnosis perhaps a little bit later and then they start unmasking and they have to start the process of getting to know who they actually are um so since your diagnosis, have you had any specific moments of self-discovery or self-acceptance? I think it's really ongoing. And I think it's so much more ongoing than you realize or like you're prepared for. Like, I think when I got that diagnosis, it was like, woohoo, like I'm me <laughs> now. I know who I am. Like I can finally be myself. And I think I thought that that was kind of unmasking that it was like mm. oh okay I'm just gonna I don't know let myself be a bit more chaotic I'm not gonna force myself to make eye contact it was that first initial wave and then it was actually like oh no like the mask isn't just this like very thin thing at the front it's like 90% of my personality mm. like it is literally <laughs> who I've made myself be mm. all these years like I actually don't really know who's under there um and I think it's because you've spent in my case, like 24 years, 25 years, well now 26 years being, cause I still am, I, I, I've been that person for such a long time. It's an, like, the, it's not that I go into a situation and think, right, I'm gonna mask now. That's the natural state of being. It's like a really conscious effort to not mask. Mm. Like it's a really conscious, like it's so easy to slip back into that. I think it's like, when you like step back, it's like, an obvious thing like well of course you spent 24 years being one person you're not suddenly going to be able to just not be that person anymore mm. um but it feels like it should be the most natural thing in the world to be yourself but when you spent so long not being yourself then it's actually hard work it's like one figuring out who yourself is but two letting that happen rather than just naturally slipping into a, i think in private and with like my close circle i'm unmasked like quite a lot now mm. um my mum came we were just saying before about my TED talk my my mum came with me and I obviously I'm quite unmasked around my probably she's the person that sees me the most myself out of anybody um and she obviously doesn't see me in like public settings that often mm. and when afterwards when we came out she was like literally when you walked through that door to meet the other the other people and like the people that were organizing it and stuff she was like it was literally like like someone took over your body almost and it was like hi like so nice to meet you and then she was like you're that's i've not seen that you in such a long time because i've got used to you being more yourself but yeah i think it's it's really ongoing and it's it's hard work to not i think for me as well like um so i'm really into like i'm a big football fan um i'm really into indie music and those I don't know those things like going to gigs and going to football matches in any other situation would be like my worst nightmare because it's like loud busy people close to you like mm. a lot going on um so for me it's like figuring out like do I actually like those things and then I kind of don't mind the sensory stress that comes with it or do I just feel like I have to enjoy going to gigs because I like indie music? Mm. And it's like, do I actually enjoy going to football matches or do I just enjoy football? So I feel like to be a proper football fan, I have to go mm. to the matches. Um, and I think that's a tricky one to figure out because it is a hard balance of like, well, yeah, I do enjoy these things, but they, they cause me a lot of like a lot of stress <laughs> as well. I think it is a really weird one of like, yeah, navigating navigating who that that person mm. is i read as well i think it was in unmasking autism by dr Devin price um he talks about how because of a lot of the stereotypes of autism are like this like sheldon cooper character there's almost like this internalized ableism of like fear of unmasking because it's like well what if the unmasked version under like what if the ellie behind all of this mask is really annoying really mm socially awkward what if it's basically sheldon cooper hiding there inside of me <laughs> and i mm. if i start unmasking then that's going to be who i am and no one's going to like me mm. and i'm going to be this like i don't know difficult person um because of that i think that's a really interesting thing as well because it's like you like to think that you're accepting of yourself and you're you know not 
not feeling ableist things about autistic people or ADHD people. But there mm. is, I think, in all of us still that bit of fear of like, oh, well, what if I let my guard down and then I'm this incredibly annoying person? So it does kind of, you cling on to the mask a little mm. bit. Like, oh, at least I know that they like this version yeah. a little bit. <laughs> like, like, they might not like me the most, but at least they like me a bit. So maybe I'll keep that safety blanket. Mm. But yeah, I think it's a really ongoing process. As a, just continuing the topic of masking a little bit but transitioning into another area as a autistic ADHD who is owning being your true self and taking off the mask how does that go what does dating look like in that situation I feel like I've had to completely uh start again I think I think the first thing that I kind of realized was like that my type is probably so different to what I thought it was I think it was almost like I'd my type of who I was attracted to was almost copied again, like part of mimicking. It was like, oh, well, everybody else thinks that he's good looking. So mm. he's good looking and everybody else fancies him. So <laughs> I must fancy him. And I think a lot of my type had been learned from that. And I think it was like, looking back, it was a very like specific type as well. So it was almost like, oh yes, I've learned that that is the person that I'm supposed to be attracted to and I'm supposed to date. So I'll just find a clone of that person every <laughs> single time. So in the first part was realizing, actually unmasking is realizing who am I actually attracted to? Not just who I've thought is the right person to be attracted mm. to. And I think that's looked like, you know, widening the type of like men that I was dating, but also a lot of like things that I haven't even worked out yet. Like, Am I, am I straight? I don't know. Cause I've just learned that being straight is, you know, there's a lot of compulsory like heteronormativity. Am I straight? Or have I just copied being straight from all the people around me? That was a really, I don't, I still don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, so I think that was a big one of like, yeah, mm. rediscovering who do I actually want to date? Um, and I think masking, I think even now, like even the last person that I've dated, like in the summer, I look back at that time and I'm like, I was masking so much more during the time that I was dating that person versus my usual self, because it's almost easy to slip into that character of like, oh, this is who I am on a date. Like mm. this is, you know, I play the woman and they play the man. Yeah. And then this is, I don't know. I think it's really easy to slip into like who you think you should be on it. I think everyone mm. has that element of like wanting to impress the person, right? Yeah. But I think mm. when you're masking, that is like amplified so much more. Um, but I think like refiguring out what I need from somebody as well is really important. Like I know now that communication is really important to me, that clarity is really important. I can't read between the lines. I, if you don't tell me what we are, I have got no idea what we are and I'll just be anxious all the time because I won't know what's going on. So I think like finding somebody that is comfortable enough to be clear, be open, be honest, um, which is not very easy to do I think um I was like talking to my counselor about it and she was like being an autistic person who dates men mm. is a very difficult job to do because the way that men are socialized is to not be open about their feelings and to not be clear um which isn't mm. necessarily their fault that's just like the way that we're all socialized in like a patriarchal world so it's very <laughs> difficult to do I think it's still <laughs> a work in progress um but yeah I think it's basically been starting again from zero of like who do I want, do I, like, what do I want a relationship to look like? Because I also know that I need a lot of time to myself and I need a lot of time to unwind. Um, yeah, what do I need from somebody? I think it is mm. basically starting all over again. <laughs> she had so much relatability. And I'm thinking about um, when you meet someone and you go on a first date, the societal expectation is you go out for dinner. And for me, that's my worst nightmare, if I'm honest with myself. I don't really like sort of sat across a table. I get frustrated with having to wait for the bill at the end, all this kind of stuff. But I suppose my question as an autistic ADHD, what does your ideal first date look like? Yeah, I think as a rule, I would do like no sitting across the table from each other. Because yeah. again, it is like, I don't want to just you feel uncomfortable the whole time because you're not used to the fact that mm. I don't make eye contact. And I don't want me to feel like I should be making eye contact with you the whole time. So that's like a general rule of no sitting across the table from each other. I think, I don't know, I think I'd, like, I quite like just going for a drink because I feel like I'm quite a, a pub person rather than like a bar or fancy place person. I'm quite an old man pub person. So, like going for a drink, but I think activity dates are a good one mm. because you're doing something and it gives you something to talk about yeah. rather than like trying to come up with small talk. Um, but I think it's a hard one to navigate for me as well because quite a lot of my life is online now. So I always, 
I always feel like a really weird balance of, oh, they probably know a lot more about me than I know about <laughs> them because I'm just sharing my whole life constantly on the internet. So I think that's a weird one. But yeah, I would say an activity date is a good one because you've got like a thing to talk about, like I don't know, mini golf or bowling mm. or whatever. Um, and a walk's quite nice because you're, again, not having to make, yeah. I think eye contact <laughs> is the biggest one for me to avoid in a first date. Um, just movement as well, I feel, yeah. just allows my brain to think better yeah and getting to know someone if we're moving we're doing something active rather than just sat at, at a table i think you're going to get a better version of me yeah yeah definitely i think you're less thinking about well, what should i say what should i do like yeah. how am i going to move this conversation on and you're more just mm. being a human yeah do you think you're quite sensitive to rejection <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> um i think this is one that has like made a lot of things make sense when you like first have that moment where you learn about RSD and you're like ah okay this this makes a lot of sense but I think for me it more shows up as that I'm a massive people pleaser I think obviously there's like the the emotional side that comes when like there is rejection or perceived rejection but I think for me it's almost like preventative like I will never get to the point of rejection because I will do everything in my power to make you like me um, and I think that's been a really hard one to work through I think it's again like the mask it's like you can't just stop being a people pleaser one day it's like your natural reaction to do anything and everything to be the most palatable mm. person in the whole entire world um but yeah I guess that's another thing that I'm trying to work through at the moment yeah. it must be hard because you, if you take off the mask and then you are your truer self you're probably opening yourself up to rejection more because you're actively stopping yourself from being a people pleaser yeah i think it's like the double whammy isn't it because it's like you're stopping being a people pleaser so people are going to be less pleased i guess but yeah. then i think also <laughs> like unfortunately we live in a world that is still quite ableist that isn't very well receiving of an unmasked autistic adhd person so mm. it's like I am, it's not right, but it's true that if I am more openly autistic, I am going to experience more rejection because people aren't used to seeing an unmasked autistic person or aren't, you know, it's we're living quite an ableist world. So if I am, I don't know, making less eye contact, if I am talking like, I don't know, talking more about my special interests rather than making pleasant small talk it's more likely that people are you know if i'm naturally being more blunt and monotonous in the way that i communicate it's likely that those things are going to cause more rejection anyway so i think mm. that's really hard to deal with as like when you have adhd so you've got the rsd and you're trying to unmask as an autistic person that's a really hard thing to do because it's like i want to learn to be my true self but i also know that in doing that less people are going to like me and that's a really hard, like it's like double like i don't know it's like mm. a, a rock and a hard place of like okay well i can keep masking which is going to exhaust me it's going to make me unwell but at least people are going to like me a bit more or i've got to unmask and i've got to deal with the fact that actually less people are going to be nice about that i guess i think it's mm. something that i really um struggle with in my work as well because i as bad as it is i know that a lot of the reason for my um like relative success i think is like that i'm quite palatable like i am still quite heavily masked and i'm still you know i have white privilege i have pretty privilege i have able-bodied privilege when i go into talk at a workplace for example i'm still quite a palatable person for them to see i'm still quite nice and bubbly and chatty mm. and smiley and all of those things whereas if I unmask more and more and I turn up and I don't take off my ear defenders because I'm dealing with the fact that the sound is too loud and I'm openly stimming and I'm rocking backwards and forwards or, you know, I'm communicating in a really blunt and concise way, that's less comfortable for the people that are in the audience because they're not used to seeing that. They're, they've not probably mm. seen a lot of unmasked like traits before. So it means that they're less likely to take on my message because it's like they're dealing with all of that oh i'm not sure how i feel about this person that is very different to people that i've mm. seen before so they're not learn they're not taking on as much as what i'm saying so i'm making less impact but also I, I can't make that much impact if i'm constantly masking if my whole thing is like talking about unmasking and then i'm turning up as a highly highly masked person then mm. i'm also not it's a really hard one to kind of i think it's you know one that's really hard for me to to like come to terms with as well as like and i know that the more that i do become like visibly different the 
the less palatable I'm going to be and probably the more um, like unpleasant comments that I'm opening myself up for as well. You know, like as of now, I'm quite lucky that I don't get touch wood <laughs> that much hate on the internet. But if I was, again, stimming more openly and rocking backwards and forwards or not looking at the camera and all of those things, then I probably would receive more negative feedback mm. as well. It's so important to address the points that you've made and you're you're doing that all the time in the work and the content that you put out on the various social media platforms what you're doing is you're normalizing all of this behavior the millions of other versions of you are perhaps stopping themselves from doing or they'll see you normalizing it and then they'll be able they'll feel slightly more confident and comfortable in doing that that's the value that i see of one of the values of what you're doing online and that's led to a book yes. which i'm very excited to talk about yes I how think, did that happen yeah so i don't know it's all a bit of a whirlwind really <laughs> um it still doesn't feel real i don't think so yeah when i i'd started working with a management agency um and i decided that one of the things was that i wanted to do would be to write a book mm. um i think for a variety of reasons i think because it's somewhere that i could go into a lot more detail like everything that i'd done up to that point was social media which is very short form and it's you know, it's all well and good, but it, you can't really share that much in a 60 second video. So I think that was the first thing that I wanted more space to kind of dig into things. Um, but I also think it was a bit of like a, a, I don't know how to, what the word is, but I think I felt because I dropped out of school, I think that was the thing that I'd, I'd held quite like bitter for quite a long time that I don't have A-levels, I don't have a degree, um, I'm never going to be an expert. And I think it was like, oh, actually, I can almost bypass that. If I'm an author, then authors are experts, <laughs> yeah. where that's not the case at all. Like having a book or not having a book doesn't make someone any more or less of an expert, especially when we're talking about like things that are our lived experience. But I think for me, it was like, oh, people will take me seriously if I write a book. Mm. Um, so that was like part of it. Um, so I met with my literary agent and um, a few different ideas were floating about about what I could do um and uh, Rachel my literary agent who's amazing she was like I still don't feel like there is like the book on ADHD and autism like with different things like uh I don't know attachment theory attached is like the book and with um I don't know depression there was like mm. Prozac Nation and there was Lost Connections and there's like these books that people go back to time and time and time again which are like the go-to book um, but with autism and ADHD, although there are so many brilliant books out there, um, they're generally either separate, like a, just an ADHD book or an autism book, or um, they're on like more niche things, whereas like there isn't like the go-to first point of call book. Mm. And I was like, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was kind of where we got to. And mm. then, um, yeah, it was Penguin that wanted it, which is amazing. And the, the team there have been absolutely wonderful in like making it really like a pleasant experience mm. i think so many people were like don't write a book it's awful like it's so stressful um and i haven't found obviously there's been moments where i've been like oh but i haven't found it like that at all it's been really enjoyable um they've been great and yeah it still doesn't feel very real at all i think i won't really process it until it's actually in people's i think i get a paper copy this week and then Amazing. it's like uh, three so, weeks until it actually comes out so gosh, that's a proper pinch me moment isn't it when, yeah. you get, when you get a book deal and then you get the actual book in your hand I bet yeah you're that's gonna be very strange I think but yeah it's very exciting I'm really excited for for people to get their hands on it and I think I'm happy that like whether or not it was me that wrote it that that, ex that resource exists because I think a lot of the time when you get diagnosed um first of all you don't really know where to turn to yourself but secondly because I think a lot of us, the way that we've understood it is through social media and through so many different collective experiences, but there's not really one place where you can like signpost a friend or family member because mm. you've done all of this different research in so many different places to finally understand yourself, but you can't then send, I don't know, a hundred different links yeah. to everyone. To, but whereas mm. I feel like the book is something that you could give to your partner, to your friend, to your colleague of like, here you go. If you read this, you'll understand me a lot better. So yeah, I'm happy that that exists for, for people as well. Are you allowed to say if there's a particular chapter or a particular bit that you enjoyed writing the most? Ooh. I think all of it was really nice to do. I think, be I think because it's all stuff that I've spent so long, again, researching and looking into and obsessing over and talking about that it almost just like <laughs> naturally <laughs> just like came out, like it was all in there stirring. Mm. Um, I think the one that was like um, maybe most difficult to write, but 
most rewarding once I'd got it all out um, was I wrote, well, a couple maybe, I wrote about like late diagnosis and mental health. So that's quite like a personal one about my experience. So I think that was quite, um, I don't know, it was really hard to do, but it was quite a nice way to process it mm. and get it into like, okay, that, that happened and I've written it down. And yeah, I think that was quite a nice one. And then I've also written a chapter about um, like pretty privilege and ableism. So almost like how, because society has this idea of like disabled equals bad or that a disabled person looks a certain way or whatever mm. it might be, that that's a lot of the reason why people go undiagnosed because people look at me and they see normal person. Um, they don't then understand that that normal person is also a disabled mm. person. Um, so that one was quite, again, a tricky chapter to navigate, but it was, it felt really, um, yeah, nice to see it all come together. And it felt quite rewarding to have it like all there, sort of like made sense of it kind of thing. Such a good idea because you've put so much valuable content out on social media. And if you want to kind of find specific bits, you have to either scroll down loads of LinkedIn or Instagram, but to compact it all into a book, I think it's going to be so valuable for the community. And I personally can't wait to get my hands on it. I'm so excited. Yeah, I hope so. Fingers crossed. <laughs> when you're having meetings with Penguin, and you're sat in their office and they're saying they want to sign you as a an author do you get imposter syndrome yeah massively i think that was one i think that was one of the main moments where it's been like what is actually going on here like i think <laughs> i think it is i think it's the imposter syndrome kind of but i think it's also just like how surreal it feels like i think it makes me really emotional like i think i touched on the fact that like i i underestimate so much of the time like how much of a a rough ride it's been up until this point so when mm. it's like moments like that it's like oh my goodness I, I had to drop out of school and now I'm writing a book with the biggest publishing house in the world like that is like there's no words that is wild um so I think it's more that that it's like a big thing to process mm. which I think can be hard as well when you're autistic that people understand that we struggle to process big emotions like when they're negative ones but also big positive emotions are just as equally difficult to process like I think when you've had a rough time growing up you learn and because we naturally I think both ADHD as and autistic people we feel things so intensely you almost learn that you can't like you have to like keep big feelings at arm's length because it's like if I let this come in at its full wave this is gonna knock me out so I think we've learned to do that to deal with like big bad feelings and it's mm. like keep them at arm's length because otherwise this is going to take me out but then it's also difficult for the big good feelings to come through because it's like your body can't really differentiate which it just feels like oh big feeling this is scary you must keep this mm. over there so i think I, it takes me a while to process things as well um but yeah definitely i think it's like double imposter syndrome as well because it's like the normal stuff of like yeah i am just a normal 20 well 26 year old now at the time person like I don't have a degree I've only been diagnosed not a very long time like do I know what I'm talking about like am I sure that I have enough information to write this book but then I think there's the double thing of almost like the ableism side as well of like am I going to be able to write a book when I can't even sit still for five minutes like are they going to take me seriously in this meeting when I can't look them in the eye when I'm sat with a fidget toy like that feels quite silly I think you know I'm trying to um teach people that it's okay mm. but it's still there is a little bit of you that's like come on ellie you're in a meeting with penguin why are you playing with a toy um so i think there is that kind of like adds to it as well mm. that it's the, the thoughts in your head are almost double of like the natural imposter syndrome that everybody feels and then there's also the like come on ellie like stop fidgeting or doodling because they're going to think that you're not listening or come on like look them in the eye because you want mm. them to take you seriously i think that like adds to it as well it's so inspiring i think you know the first person that stands up against the stereotype and unashamedly takes that fidget toy into a meeting or on stage and does a talk with it they're the ones that are going to get the most resistance from other people so it takes a huge amount of bravery to be one of the first which is why i think so much people have admiration and respect for the work you're doing you're putting you're like putting hope and confidence into a whole generation of people below you and above you a whole community to just normalize a particular bit of behavior that that people were ashamed to do before i think that's why part of the reason why so many people have have have, have gravitated to, to you as an individual online thanks i think it's like in a weird way i think knowing that or feeling that as well 
helps me because it's like, okay, even if I feel slightly uncomfortable going on stage with my fidget toy, I know that this is helping other people to mm. do that. So it's almost, I think it works both ways of like, it helps other people if I do it because they feel able to, but me knowing not the pressure, but almost like the, the feeling of like this will in turn help others Mm. um makes it easier for me to do it for myself i think like when you're advocating for yourself as well like that feels so uncomfortable like for anybody it feels so scary to be like actually i need these accommodations or i have these needs or i need you to do this thing for me or i need this support that feels really scary to do for yourself but if i can tell myself okay if i i don't know ask for an agenda ahead of this call then that makes it easier for other people who have meetings with these people to ask mm. for an agenda. If I ask about a quiet space at an event, then it means that there's a quiet space there for other people there that need it that might not. It's almost like, I guess it's a bit of the people pleasing, but in a good way. Mm. Um, so I think it, it does work both ways of like, it's, it's helpful for me to know that other people are going to benefit from mm. my little moment of scariness. I saw a really interesting post you did I think it was on LinkedIn, where you spoke about the autism paradox. Can you, for the listeners of this, can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, so I spoke about how, um, like, as an autistic person, I naturally kind of remove myself, like keep myself to myself and go in my own little bubble quite often. Um, but then because of that, feel lonely. So it's almost like the overwhelm of the way that the world is, isn't set up for autistic people to be a part of in terms of like sensory stuff in terms of social situations like everything is quite draining mm. so it's natural for us to kind of bring ourselves back and keep ourselves to ourselves and isolate ourselves um but then it's like oh well then you know why is why is no one inviting me places and why is no one talking to me it's like well because <laughs> you don't go anywhere if you say no every time then people are going to stop inviting you um but i think it is a really a really tricky thing to navigate mm. i think especially as an someone that's an ADHD as well as autistic it's like I really have to really be careful of managing my energy because if I let the ADHD take over it's so easy to just like Ferrari it and take on everything and say yes to everything and have a hundred things coming up and then the autistic burnout is like a ticking time bomb waiting to happen mm. so I have to really be careful not to do too much because I know the consequences of that is that I'll be burnt out and I won't be able to get out of bed for a week so that means saying no to a lot of stuff, which means isolating myself. I think especially for me when I've got loads of exciting things happening in like my career and, and work, that naturally means that I have to save the energy and can't do as many things like social wise. And I think mm. it's the same for everybody that, you know, you don't, we're in a world where it wouldn't feel right to take a day off sick because you were stressed from work, but then see your friend in the evening, we would feel some sort of guilt for that. Cause it's like, Oh, well, if I'm off sick, then I've got to be really sick and I can't leave the house, which, you know, isn't the case if you're, that's two completely different things that you have the capacity for or not mm. for, but that's how we feel that we feel that the work stuff has to be the priority. Um, and if we, then it's like all the other stuff that recharges us has to be the one that gets wiped off, you know, mm. when we're trying to save some charge. Um, but yeah, I think that's, you know, it's not the case. We need to all get better at realizing, actually, this is the battery that I have and I don't need to drain it with the work stuff. And then if there's any little tiny scraps left, I can do nice things. Like I'm allowed mm. to use, like save a good half of it yeah. for like social <laughs> things and nice things. So, yeah. If you could go back in time, pre-diagnosis to that moment you felt different. Do you have any words of inspiration for younger Ellie? Yeah, I think I would say like, focus on the people that love you rather than the ones that don't. I think for my whole high school experience, well, my whole growing up experience, it was like very much, I always wanted to find a way to make, like to fit in with the popular people and to make everybody like me. And mm. that was like, please everybody and just be liked, be popular. When actually if I'd have focused on finding one or two friends that actually really liked me and were you know maybe not the most popular people in the world but they were more similar to me and I, I could have had genuine friends rather than trying to make everybody like me and ending up with no real friends finding just like focusing on yeah the people that liked me rather than trying to win over the ones that didn't mm. yeah no that's amazing I think a lot of people will listen to that and um it's almost like you're speaking to a younger generation who haven't quite got the awareness perhaps that you have now as you're sort of giving them that, that little bit of advice, I think it will be super, super helpful. I think as well, like hopefully we're moving towards 
a world slightly where I think it's still probably not nice for the outsiders but I think there is in like all ways that it's kind of a bit more okay to be I don't know weird or a bit of an outsider or to have your own interests mm. whereas I think when I was you know a teenager it was very much like either you fit in or you have the worst time in the whole entire world yeah. <laughs> um so I think it's like now hopefully where well if you know if I was at school now I'd be able to find people that were into the stuff that I was into rather than mm. just like yeah be forcing myself to be somebody that I really wasn't bit of a fun one maybe What's the most impulsive thing you've ever done? Ooh, I mean, I'm literally covered in yeah. tattoos. <laughs> and most of them were like just walking into a tattoo shop and going, I'd like that one now, please. So I'd say that was that was probably a sign. Like someone probably should have looked at the fact that I was covered in tattoos. Yeah. And like none of them had been booked in advance. Probably should have gone, mm, maybe yeah. there's something about your impulse control that's slightly <laughs> off here. I've got one, which was in uh, Las Vegas, up the stratosphere. That was very, uh, very impulsive. A long story, that one. <laughs> Um, what do you say to the people who say that ADHD is just a trend? This one really infuriates me. I think, you know, it's not a trend. It's, there's no benefit to saying that you have ADHD when you don't. I think people think that it's like, oh yeah, I'll jump on this thing for, I don't know, a bit of attention or whatever. Well, I don't get any positive attention. Like it's not a positive, you know, if anything, people look down on it rather than you know a pre like thinking that it's a cool thing to have um but i think that massively underestimates the it's a disability and it has a disabling effect on so many people's lives like i had to drop out of school that's a you know it's not something that i've just gone oh yeah it'd be quite quite cool to have this like it's had a massive effect on my life mm. as it has on you know it's got to have had a massive effect on your life for you to be able to get diagnosed that's part of the diagnostic criteria so i think one it's not a trend two saying it's a trend massively undermines the experiences of the people and three like the last thing that we need to be doing right now is to put people off from going for a diagnosis because the people that are getting diagnosed now have been let down by the system their entire life they've been undiagnosed they've been unsupported they've been unmedicated they've been misunderstood they're finally getting those answers, which mm. is going to change their whole life going forward and change the way that they look at their whole lives going backwards. They're going to like, uh, you know, forgive themselves. They're going to understand the way that it's been. So that moment is life changing for so many people. But if people are saying, oh, it's a trend, everyone's getting diagnosed now, people might put off going to their doctors. They might put off telling anyone about their diagnosis. They might put off even looking into it because they think, oh, no, I'm not, I don't want to get accused of jumping mm. on the bandwagon. And that is like the last thing that we need to do. Like I am proof that getting that moment changes and can change your whole life. So why would we want to scare people off from that? Why, mm. like we need to just support people rather than, I don't know, looking down on it in any sort of way. Gosh, yeah, no, powerful. I don't think anyone could have said that better. <laughs> um, amazing. Can you explain what body doubling is? Yeah, so body doubling is kind of a tool that people use to help with productivity. So it's basically the idea that someone, you're copying the body of somebody else essentially. So someone either sits alongside you while you're doing a task or you can do it virtually as well by Zoom. Mm. But um, basically the idea that, yeah, you're doing a task alongside somebody else. So me and my friend Charlie, we body double every not today, but every, <laughs> every Monday morning, we have an hour every week in our calendars where we body double. So we just sit for an hour on a video call and we both do any admin tasks that we need to do. Um, and just basically the, the accountability of having someone sat there doing the same thing that you're doing mm. helps to motivate you to do it. Um, so it could be the same thing as literally just having someone come and uh, clean alongside you while you're cleaning or sit alongside you while you're studying or even going to a cafe because if you go to a cafe it tends to be that other people in that cafe are working mm. so basically just yeah another human doing the same thing that you're doing at the same time helps you to be accountable to doing that thing fascinating thank you so much ellie um and finally when's I should have asked this before. When's the book out? <laughs> the book is out on the 26th of October, which is pre -order soon. Pre-order it now, right? Yeah, it's pre available to pre-order now. And pre-orders are, I hate doing this like self-promotion thing, yeah. but pre-orders are really great for authors because it lets retailers know that people are actually interested in the book. So then more places are likely to stock it, which means it's more likely to get in the hands of people that would benefit from it. So yeah, you can pre-order it now. And I'm so excited for it to get in people's hands. I can't wait to read it. And I will put all that, all the links to it in the show notes. Ellie, Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me.